I had previously suggested Nvidia might be in a hurry to launch Ampere before AMD's RDNA 2 cards and the next gen consoles all turned up to rain on Turing's parade. And now we have AMD's RX 6800 series GPUs for some comparison. But making comparisons isn't so easy. Given how many products AMD has launched on 7 nanometer, we expect them to be somewhat supply constrained. But Nvidia is using Samsung's very mature 8 nanometer process, which has been operational for years, and Nvidia says they may not have full availability until sometime next year. So it's very difficult to compare cards that you just can't get. But using the information that is available, we'll do our best. The new RX 6800 XT forced Nvidia to move the Titan Class 102 die down a level. That is no small feat. To force Nvidia to sell TI dies at 80 class prices is impressive. To force them to rush their launch also speaks to their execution. But I don't believe Nvidia was scared of the 6800 series GPUs. It was the consoles they were worried about. Next-gen consoles had come out before the 3000 series and were being compared favorably to Nvidia's expensive top-of-the-line flagship GPUs. It would look very bad. So they had to get ahead of that. Of course, the RTX 3080 is a lot faster than a console, but to the casual gamer and the average observer, which is the majority of the market, looking at them side by side, it would be difficult to justify spending three times the money on upgrading a PC or a new PC when the consoles deliver this kind of quality. What I'm saying here is in no way a dig at the new RTX series graphics cards. I think they're very impressive. The RTX 3080 is very fast and somewhat sensibly priced too, up to 70% faster than the RTX 2080 in games at 4K. Gains in DX11 titles are kind of variable that's got a lot to do with CPU overheads and the inherent limitations of DirectX 11. In a well-optimized title like Doom Eternal, it's almost double the performance. And even more in compute workloads like Blender. There's been a lot of comparisons to Vega. People calling the RTX 3000 series compute heavy. And it may just prefer the use of modern DX12 Vulkan APIs over DX11. AMD was pushing high core count CPUs and compute heavy GPUs back when 90% of games being released were still using DirectX 11 and limited to four threads. And they took a lot of heat for that. Back in early 2019, benchmarks showed the Radeon 7 performed on par with the 2080 in Sniper Elite 4, Rage 2, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, World War Z, Strange Brigade. But games on these newer APIs were still edge cases, and the Radeon 7 fell behind in many more cases than it matched or even led. In August 2017, of the 25 games Hardware Unboxed tested with the Vega 56, only 6 of them used DX12 or Vulkan, under a quarter. Now let's fast forward to March of 2020 from 2% faster to 11% faster. But this isn't because of driver updates. This is primarily because the games list has changed. The percentage of games using these newer APIs is much higher. Vega was designed for these APIs. In the 3080 roundup, all of the games, except for Microsoft Flight Simulator, used DX12 or Vulkan. So we've come a long way, and that's great. Maybe the RTX 3000 does need DX12 or Vulkan to be able to make full use of all of its cores. And I hope that's the case. That's the direction we need to be going in. Some people aren't particularly pleased that the 3080 being so compute heavy doesn't necessarily give them the expected frame rates at lower resolutions. In a modern title, the dominating RTX 3090 is almost double the performance of the RX 5700 XT. But that's at 4K. When we go down to 1080p, the $1,500 GPU is barely 36% faster. Of course, you don't buy an RTX 3090 for 1080p gaming, but it does show the scaling difficulties. To clarify what I mean by shader heavy, the RTX 3080 brings a 300% increase in FP32 performance. However, it only brings 50% increase in ROPS whereas the 6800 XT doubles both its FP32 and its ROPS from the 5700 XT. But obviously somebody at Nvidia asked the question, do we really need to spend die space on frame rates that monitors just can't show? Do we want 500 frames a second at 1080p? Or do we want playable frame rates at 4K and beyond? It's a trade-off. You've only got a certain amount of die space to work with. 
and no two gamers are the same, so there's no right answer here. For sub 4K resolution gamers and competitive gamers, AMD may have just hit a home run here. But for people like myself who do 4K gaming and some content creation and other compute workloads on the side, the 3080 with its 30 teraflops of FP32 looks really compelling. And in that regard, it is kind of Vega-like. Reviewers didn't rush to recommend Vega at the time, but if you have a Vega 56, then you're able to play modern Vulcan titles like Doom Eternal at 100 frames a second at 1440p. That's not bad for a three-year-old card, and that longevity is purely down to the software optimizations catching up to the hardware. It's one thing to have a card that ages well, but that doesn't really help you if the performance is not great out of the box. The problem is Vega never had the market penetration required to push developers ahead in using these new APIs. And that's a real shame, DirectX 11 just can't scale. It should have died five years ago, but the install base of DX11 hardware wasn't going away, and the difficulty in porting the big engines over to DX12 put up a roadblock to change. When Vega was released, Vulkan support was rare, and DX12 support was still experimental in Unreal Engine, the biggest game engine on the planet. That was always going to work against them. With Nvidia now benefiting more from these newer APIs and the next-gen consoles coming, I think we're finally going to drag ourselves out of two decades of legacy code. This will be great for all gamers on all platforms, and for fans of any brand. But its reliance on these new APIs is just one thing. Ampere and Vega are compute heavy. Great in Blender, but scaling games wasn't always helped. It's really funny to see AMD and Nvidia switch roles. The 6800 XT is going to be roughly double the performance of the Radeon 7 in games, but at best, probably only 70% faster in compute workloads like Blender. A lot has been said about the scaling of the RTX 3090, in case is only 10% faster than the 3080. Some say this is because it's a compute card, better suited to professional applications, but it's really not. It hasn't got Pro Driver certification, but that's not the only thing. It's crippled in ways that a Pro card isn't. The double precision performance on the $1500 2020 RTX 3090 is 556 gigaflops. The same FP64 double precision performance on the 2017 Vega 56 is 659 gigaflops. The Radeon 7 packs three and a half teraflops, and that's still artificially limited. I know there's a lot of workloads, gaming, AI, which don't need FP64, but there's also a huge number which do. And this goes to show Nvidia went out of their way to stop these cards being used in a certain number of high-end scenarios. The RTX 3090 also doesn't support SRIOV, meaning you can't share the GPU between multiple virtual machines or more importantly, the host and the virtual machine. Video production is where it perhaps shines, and that's a big enough market for NVIDIA. Whereas Ampere has gone all out on FP32 performance, AMD has done a 180, and now we have two very different cards that are gonna be great in very different ways. The key differences. The first and most obvious difference is the memory bandwidth. The RTX 3080 is faster. The AMD card has 60% more VRAM, but you'll never see a game use that. Borderlands 3, Red Dead Redemption 2, AC Valhalla, they don't even break 7 gig of VRAM usage at 4K Ultra. By the time any mainstream game is released that uses double that VRAM, neither of these cards will have the compute capacity to keep up anyway. And it doesn't matter if you're upscaling to 8K or 16K because your base render resolution is still much lower and doesn't require a lot of VRAM. Developers are going to target the standard 8 gig for many years to come, and the RTX 3080 has some headroom there. The other aspect is as games increasingly leverage our fast SSDs to continuously stream in assets, we don't have to maintain everything in VRAM all at once. Other tricks like compression and sampler feedback also alleviate some memory issues. Delving under the hood, things get even more interesting, and this really highlights how important hardware-specific optimizations are going to be for the next generation games. With so much more FP32 performance, there are clearly workloads where the RTX 3080 will win hands down, but that's not always the only operation that a game is performing. Half Precision, FP16, or what AMD has been calling Rapid Packed Math, runs on the AMD card at double rate, so a little over 40 teraflops. On Ampere, this is still locked to the same 30 teraflops as FP32. To get the full 60 teraflops, you need to use the tensor cores. And on Ampere, only half of the cores are able to do int 32, locking you in at around 15 teraflops. AMD very kindly tells us exactly how many operations per instruction type they can do. 
At 256 operations per cycle per CU, you can do FP16 operations outputting to either an FP16 or FP32 register at 40 teraflops. Common FP32 workloads gives us our 20 teraflops, the same for our integer 32s. And when we go down to 16-bit, 8-bit, and even 4-bit integer operations, our throughput jumps from 40 to 80 to 160 tera operations a second. This is easy, I understand it. The higher your precision, the slower your throughput. Basic. But Ampere gets a bit weird. We've got six GPCs. For whatever reason, four of those have 12 SMs and two of them have 10. And then within those SMs are two data paths, giving you either 128 FP32 operations per clock or 64 FP32 plus 64 int 32 operations per clock. So Ampere's FP16 is locked at 30 teraflops. The int32 performance is locked at 15, but that's non-tensor. If you use the tensor cores, you get significantly higher rates, closer to 60 teraflops. And to complicate matters even more, the lower precision integer 8 and integer 4 ops are only supported using the tensors. The 3080 is faster, no doubt about it, but there's something to be said for the straightforward simplicity of AMD's approach. I think this is important because while traditionally 3D games have heavily relied on FP32 performance, there are workloads where mixed precision and FP16 come in very handy. Ray traversal through your BVH and denoising, probably just the tip of the iceberg. So that brings us to ray tracing. NVIDIA's white paper says that the 3080 handles 58 RT teraflops. I have no idea what that means. Things are a little bit more straightforward on the AMD side. We get four ray box or one ray triangle intersection per ray accelerator per CU per clock cycle. That gives us a number around 68% faster than the Xbox One X. And then here's where things get even more tricky. The more of your BVH data structure that you can keep in AMD's L3 or AKA Infinity Cache, the better off you are. But of course, the more of that structure that's in that cache, the less is available for frequently used textures and other game data. When we turn on ray tracing in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the RX 6800 XT takes about a 50% hit in performance. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is of course just shadows. In Dirt 5, which is also just ray trace shadows, the hit is a much lower 20%. The performance hit for the RTX 3080 is a more consistent 37 or 32%. I have a sneaking suspicion that given the slightly extra number of ray accelerators, the higher clock speed, and the benefit of the infinity cache, that ray tracing on the RDNA 2 cards could be faster than the RTX 3080. Not the shading of those pixels, but just the traversal. Perhaps this is why we're seeing it perform so well in games where the ray tracing component is only shadows. It's a very small structure by comparison, and there's not a lot of shading involved. I really look forward to seeing how it performs in global illumination scenarios. I'm really impressed with the efficiency and almost elegance of AMD's part. It's down on memory bandwidth, it's down on shaded performance, and yet somehow it keeps up with Nvidia's much more powerful part. It's like the little engine that could of GPUs. Nvidia has a couple of billion more transistors and a slightly higher power budget, but right out of the gate without any specific optimizations, AMD is in the ballpark. Now with some specific optimizations, the 6800 series can get faster. There are going to be cases where it handily beats the RTX 3080, but overall, in most cases, the sheer extra grunt of Nvidia's GPU is going to be really tough to beat. There's no replacement for displacement, as they say. All other things aside, at the end of the day, all of your pixels have to get shaded. No amount of optimization can make up for the deficit here. Many people might suggest that we're now a post-fixed resolution world. Technologies like variable rate shading, dynamic resolution, neural rendering, denoising, dynamic screen refresh rates, input lag mitigation, and various other tricks are all going to work together to give you an experience that is perceptually very similar to the experience you would get on much faster hardware. That's kind of true, but there are a couple of problems with that. But the faster the hardware, the higher quality inputs you can use, and the better quality post-processing you have access to. The goalposts will always keep moving. It's not like the resolution doesn't matter argument hasn't been kicking around forever, and yet we still aren't fooled between a digital display and reality. When comparing directly between two similar technologies of similar generation, then yes, minor differences are largely irrelevant. But you can only rely on tricks for so long before you're clearly looking like you're a generation behind. 
Being 20% down on shader performance is not going to be a problem for the PlayStation 5. But in the case of these two GPUs, the 6800 XT being down 50%, that's a reasonably big gap. In the real world, the performance difference won't be 50% though, and that's because it's so efficient. Even with 20 teraflops of performance, the 6800 XT's efficiency in terms of time spike stream points per teraflop is slightly higher than the 5700 XT. And at least in this benchmark, we can see that the RTX 3080 and 3090 cards have taken a big regression when it comes to efficiency. Monster power, but they can't put it all to the ground. At least, not always. So AMD has officially returned to the high end and they've done a very good job and it's going to be an interesting couple of years ahead, but they haven't earned the title of Nvidia killer. And the 6900 XT's extra 11% CUs isn't going to get it there either. While AMD's card isn't the king and doesn't take the crown, it's going to take market share. It's an impressive product. But we also have to remember this is a stopgap architecture. The addition of the efficiency boosting CPU-like L3 cache is a taste of something. RDNA 3 will be on TSMC's 5 nanometer process with a 1.8 times increase in transistor density. Apple is currently spending billions of dollars to ensure that the yield is very high. Even if AMD did absolutely nothing else, just by moving to that new process, they could reduce the size of the 6800 XT die from 520 millimeters squared to around 300, and with a 30% reduction in power. They could cut the die size down by a third and still add a significantly larger cache and more CUs. But all that is a discussion for another day. But while we're talking about die sizes, it's worth noting that the 6800, the 6800 XT and the 6900 XT are all the exact same chip. So that's why the 6800 is priced higher than the 3070. It's because AMD doesn't really want you buying it. Or it's more accurate to say they would much rather you spend $1,000 on that chip than five or 600. I want an RTX 3080 for its insane blender performance, but I also want an RX 6800 XT for its incredible sub 4K gaming performance, its ultra low idle power, its USB type C port, but most of all just because it's really interesting. But for now I'll just have to add these two to my PlayStation 5 on the list of things I can't get.